Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Russia's build-up of its military strength in Crimea since it annexed the peninsula seven years ago gives some credence to its boast that it is now the dominant power in the Black Sea. So why would it give up this possible preeminence? A Ukrainian summit aims to put the issue back on the international agenda, but is Moscow listening at all? And is any amount of outside pressure going to change the situation? Good to have you along. I'm David Foster. The Black Sea is a gateway to Mediterranean influence. Russian cruise missiles are in the Crimean port of Sebastopol. Submarines, warships too. Crimea means that Moscow can wield more influence in, let's say, Syria, all of which is a threat to the West. But what can it do? Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 was condemned by many world leaders as a violation of international law. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is hosting the Crimea platform in Kiev, aimed at increasing international pressure on Russia to end its occupation of Crimea. At least 40 countries, including the United States and France, have already confirmed their participation in the summit. The US government stated Russia's occupation and increasing militarization of the Crimean Peninsula have implications far beyond Ukraine's borders, threatening the world's common security. Moscow continues to turn the peninsula into a military fortress from where it expands its influence over the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Will Russia ever end its occupation of Crimea? Let's welcome to the round table out of Moscow, Vyacheslav Matutsov, former Russian diplomat. We travel to Prague and we see Pavel Havlicek there, research fellow at the Association for International Affairs, and then to Istanbul. And we welcome Rustem Umarov, a member of parliament for Ukraine who happens to be in Turkey on business. A gentleman at the top, uh, we have Moscow. At the bottom, we have Ukraine. Uh, let's go to somebody who's an outsider as far as this is concerned, and that's you, Pavel, in, in the middle. And let me ask you, first of all, just to put into context why Crimea matters to Russia in terms of its power and its influence. I think Crimea has a specific uh, place in uh, Russian history. We all know that, uh, obviously, there are some strategic and military concerns. There are also cultural affiliations that is related to uh, the modern history of Ukraine and Russia. But first of all, uh, and foremost, I would say that it matters to Ukraine, right? Because it is in its territorial and uh, state uh, under its sovereignty. And uh, these are uh, Ukrainians uh, and Crimean Tatars that are uh, at the first place, you know, among the uh, citizens, you know, that are now being discriminated by the Russian Federation, unfortunately, since 2014. So. Yes, uh, definitely the question why it matters to Russia is very important, but uh, for me, the more, more important question is why it matters to Ukraine. Well, forgive me here, since I'm talking about the, the military buildup on the Crimean Peninsula at this particular moment, I would like to ask you, without the influence it has in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, um, how would that diminish Russia's influence in the region, and in fact, in the wider region, in the Mediterranean too? If it didn't have this base, where would it be? Yes, this is a very important matter, and that's why I referred at the first place to the strategic and military nature of the peninsula. We know that way before uh, the illegal annexation, uh, Crimea hosted a Russian base with uh, roughly uh, 20,000 uh, uh, Russian servicemen and a number of uh, uh, maritime uh, presence and uh, ships and all that. Uh, it would be uh, much less uh, visible on the regional and world stage, I, I dare to say. Uh, Crimea and the Black Sea region is uh, fundamentally important for Russia, uh, for strategic regions. Obviously, we know that um, uh, Crimea hosts uh, uh, hot water uh, uh, ports and uh, also uh, presence that is uh, strategically important. Unlike, uh, for example, the, the Arctic, uh, that is only now becoming more visible. Uh, Crimea has been a traditionally uh, a Russian military, uh, mm. let's say, uh, importance and uh, 
uh, together with the, the Far East, uh, some of All of which uh, underlines why it is so important from the Russian point of view to keep hold of uh, the Crimean Peninsula. So, Rustem, let me ask you, a member of parliament for Ukraine, you agree with the majority of the international community in saying that this is an illegal occupation. But can you see, from both the political, the cultural and the military point of view, why Russia has no intention of relieving its hold on the peninsula? I start from the culture point of view and uh, historical. For the last, let's say, as a Crimean Tatar, uh, an indigenous uh, population or indigenous people of the Crimean Peninsula and Ukraine, uh, I would say that uh, the whole history, if we would say we're descendants of the uh, people who inhabited uh, this land, and we as a descendants, as a Crimean Tatars, never wanted to be a part of Russia. In addition to it, we, of course, are a part of a civilized world. But, uh, but that I do understand that, that, and I'm coming up with that from the point of view that uh, Ukraine and the Tatars also do not see uh, what Russia is doing as at all legitimate. I'm asking you, is this going to make any difference, this kind of pressure, when Russia needs it so desperately, both from a political, a cultural and a military point of view? Is Russia going to be listening to anything that is said? It doesn't matter. Why? Because it never listens. So that is why our Ukrainian point of view is to sit to the table and continue political and diplomatic talks. It doesn't matter uh, what Russia is trying to persuade. We have international law and we ask Russia to sit for the table and negotiate how they will deoccupy, the, how will they take out their forces. We have indigenous people who have a right for self-determination, and we have determined ourselves uh, in 1991 that we will be a part of Ukraine. So we are not trying to persuade something. We want to deoccupy our land and continue living in civilized world. OK, well, Vyacheslav, let me come to you. Um, we heard there from Rustam that uh, Russia doesn't listen in his, from his point of view. Would it, that be a fair assessment, that no matter what the noise is coming out of, um, either from Kiev or from the international community, nothing is going to make Russia change its mind? Well, uh, when we're speaking today about Crimea, uh, the, the start point to discuss any question that it is not uh, a questionable principle that Ru uh, the Crimea is a Russian territory. Not uh, Crimean Tatars uh, possesses, not Ukraine, it is Russian territory, where Ukraine, their Tatarian population are now free and they have their own community and they have right to the to voice forgive language. me forgive me I, I i did stop bristol when he was trying to give us a little bit of the background that we already know i don't really want to hear the same from you my question is he says russia isn't listening won't listen and my point to you is that no matter what the international community says russia is not changing its position uh, first of all what it means international community is it not an organization or all the, all the world Let's uh, come to the conclusion that, uh, 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 that Crimea entering the Russian Federation was, ma was made according to the international law. All principles of international law were respected when it was voting uh, by the parliament of Crimea, take decision, <coughs> they proclaimed their own uh, independent uh, republic of Crimea, and this independent republic applied to Russian parliament to be uh, part of Russian federation. I, I'm That's sorry, the if, if the line is very bad, I apologize for the fact that you can't hear me. But my question is, once again, is Russia going to change its mind on this despite Never. the pressure? I am sure that not Russian government, Russian population, Russian people are very persistent. Well, we have maybe some individuals who have their own opinion on the subject. But I am speaking about the common uh, position, common position for Russian Federation, for Russian people. It is impossible to regard to re uh, this uh, decision, uh, uh, absolutely, on cultural level, because uh, uh, population of uh, Crimea are mainly in, on Russian, 
not Ukrainian, not Tatar, they are Russian. They respect their own culture, they respect their own language, and they do, then where okay, are uh, they? With, they with are... all respect, you, you have already said this. Um, Pavel, I will come to you in just a second, but my question, Vyacheslav, um, is does having the position of strength that Russia has on the Crimean Peninsula with all the submarines, cruise missiles, warships, does it leave it as a much stronger military power than it would be if it didn't have that? Uh, I think that it is question well, in Russia, Crimea is not discussable. This is Russian territory in military way, of course. I remind that uh, Sevastopol city... And Russia is much stronger with this base on Crimea. Much, Ukrainian much stronger. Would you Republic. agree with that? Of course, because Sevastopol is a main uh, military point in Crimea during Soviet Union. OK, so, so Pavel, let me come to you. So, sorry, Vyacheslav, you've given you plenty of time. Let me come to you, because you were nodding in disagreement to some of the points that were, were raised then. I don't think it's really a massive matter for debate that it is stronger with the, the port at Sebastopol, and which it had on a lease anyway, but it gives it a much more permanent position by having annexed Crimea, does it not? So what is the point of this international conference when we've established that Russia isn't budging at all? Uh, first, maybe let me comment on the pre previous speaker that I have to fundamentally disagree with most of what he said. Clearly, the overwhelming majority of the world community has not acknowledged this. There has been several uh, UN resolutions condemning the illegal annexation. And uh, also, it has been a political gesture and political gains by the uh, Putin's regime that it has annexed uh, the Ukrainian territory in such a way. Majority of the uh, Russian society would be hesitant, you know, to, to, to do it like this, you know, military way, at least. Uh, but to, back to your question. Uh, I think the, the matter of this conference is very important, and somehow uh, I would dare to disagree with also uh, Umer, uh, Mr. Umer, who, uh, who said that uh, Russia is not to listen. Probably not in the short term, but it is perceiving the upcoming Crimean platform uh, conference very carefully because Russia is very sensitive, as we have heard, you know, previously towards these matters, and it is uh, interpreting and following the developments very closely. Uh, we know that uh, Russian parliamentary elections are coming up, you know, uh, in the soon future. They should be taking place also in uh, Crimea itself, you know, again illegally, and uh, that is why Russia pays very close attention to the conference, and that is why the Zelensky initiative is so. Important important to bring the international community, more than 40 uh, members of the yeah. world community, together in... Uh, well, in this in is, Kiev, this is uh, the, the Zelensky conference. initiative, is, is the Crimean Charter, among other things. So, um, Rustem, let, let me come to you in just a second after we hear this from uh, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Of course, Ukraine was tested again uh, just weeks ago uh, this spring as Russia pushed more forces to Ukraine's border than at any time since 2014. Uh, when it invaded. And I can tell you, uh, Mr. President, that we stand strongly with you. Rustam, do you agree with that sentiment that the United States is standing strongly uh, with Ukraine on this? Yes, I do, including other international partners uh, who support us, uh, including Turkey uh, and European Union. So basically speaking, uh, President Zelensky initiated uh, such a format to gain the international support, to find a solution, and to show that Ukraine uh, is trying to find a solution, diplomatic and political solution, uh, and it is a part of civilized world. That is why we're inviting all parties to discuss this. And it is influential uh, format since after COVID, uh, well, more than 40 countries are participating in this summit. Uh, and we are actually, it's our diplomatical yes. victory. And you, we are you, sending... You know, a um, excuse me for interrupting. We, we have a saying here in England, uh, which is uh, this week's headlines, next week's fish and chip wrapper. In other words, you put your food in it the week after you've read the story. It won't matter 10 days from when the conference ended. It's consigned to history. People may say a lot of the good things, Rustam, but it's not going to lead to anything. You know, as a Crimean Tatar who, who was born in one country and uh, was raised uh, in another country and experienced an illegal annexation, I would say that uh, we are very consecutively working and we will be at the end of the day 
winning our position. Our territorial integrity is extremely important for the indigenous people of Crimea, Crimean Tatars. It is the Ukrainian territory. And no matter what, whoever thinks differently, we will be continuing our political, diplomatic efforts until we reach the result. Uh, Vladislav, let me ask you this about, about um, what Blinken said there, the massive troop build-up, the, the biggest since 2014. So we have on the border with Ukraine an inordinate number of Russian forces coming and going. Uh, in the Black Sea, we have Russian naval vessels firing at a UK vessel that it was thought had got too close. We have um, international military naval manoeuvres there. It, it's a very dangerous area right now. Do you agree? No, I don't agree. It is not dangerous. It is provocative maneuvers of uh, some s s vessels, military vessels of Britain, Great Britain, then uh, Holland, uh, and then uh, American. And so it is uh, accidents uh, on the sea that provoke Russia for some uh, intention, for political pressure on Russia. I can say that it is uh, an uh, uh, unjustable uh, uh, decision, and I think that no results will be uh, after these maneuvers. And defend. Okay, in, in that case, why does Russia continue its troop buildup on the border with Ukraine? It is not on the border of the Ukraine. It is in, on the border of uh, uh, of uh, Black Sea because we confront in, the, in uh, the Crimea, not Ukraine. Ukraine has no fleet. Ukraine has no uh, 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 possibility. I'm talking about land that. forces. I'm talking about land forces, not naval because forces. Because NATO organizations that have uh, 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 their basic forces in Romania, Bulgaria, and I don't forget that uh, Turkey is only, is also is, a member, the biggest member of NATO organization. Why should, uh, and uh, who is the main player in NATO? In NATO, the uh, main player is the United States of uh, America. Okay, may, may, of may I go? May we I go? are talking to Americans okay. through. Well, let, let, I'll tell you what, at this point, let's put in Vladimir Putin. all other people. So let, even I'm sorry America, I'm going to stop here because I want to put in Vladimir Putin's thoughts. What's the use of meeting with Zelensky when he has given full control of his country to outside management? Key decisions are being made in Washington and in Berlin and in Paris to some extent. So what you're saying, Vyacheslav, is that um, it's being controlled from outside. So once again, I point out that that's a very dangerous thing to do, isn't it? Well, uh, it is main player because confronting Russia that is decision, not Ukraine. It is decision of some higher forces, higher level of accepting some decision. It is the only American. In the world, there is one center, two centers, three centers. No, no other countries can make decision to make military exercises in the waters of international waters or uh, well, I mean, there's, a, there's the an argument territory here territory that it wasn't actually in international... It was in international Only... waters, that it wasn't in um, territorial waters, that it didn't cross into the Crimean waters at all. So, Pavel, you, your, your feelings on this... Um, well, you've been shaking your head throughout this, but I then want to ask you about um, the feasibility of a return of Crimea uh, to Ukraine. But first of all, give us your thoughts on what you've been hearing. Yes, uh, once again, I need to intervene here. Clearly, we are uh, hearing uh, one of the famous uh, Russian, uh, pro-Russian uh, sort of um, disinformation narratives, you know, that everything in Ukraine is controlled by CIA, by uh, the United States, by, by Brussels, by Soros, and other imaginary forces, you know, that are behind everything. This is the Russian paranoia that we are hearing. OK, clearly. so you disagree uh, with that, that, that point of view. I, I get that, but I want to ask you about yes, what is... What is I want, no, 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 please, please, let, let me, let me. Don't forget about it. Defender is a vessel. OK, listen, I, I, I am, I am going to take control of this. And I want to ask you, Pava, what do you think it's going to take to get Crimea back to Ukrainian control? 
Yes, my deep conviction is that uh, until uh, there are there are some fundamental changes in the Russian Federation, uh, we will not be moving very far on uh, the Crimean uh, front, basically. Uh, for example, there are some proposals made by the Russian oppositionists, uh, including um, Alexei Navalny, who himself proposed to hold another referendum in the, in the future, where people could be really democratically deciding about the future of the peninsula. It is far from being perfect and many Ukrainians would disagree, probably also many uh, Crimean Tatars, but at least this might be a way out. But, 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 but other uh, than hiring international condemnation at this summit that's coming up, what are we going to see that might hasten the end of what you consider to be an illegal occupation? What are we going to see that's going to change the situation? First of all, it will be the mobilization of the international uh, attention and international uh, political will to actually deal with this issue and put pressure on Russia. This is very important. And also, uh, coming back to one of your earlier questions, actually, why does it matter and what's going to be the sustainability of this initiative? Uh, the fundamental sustainability is that this initiative is supposed to work on several la layers. It is the parliamentary one. Uh, executive one, uh, governmental one, but also civil society and expert community. And this is, these are all generate ideas how we can be actually moving on with this fundamental issue, uh, which plays such a, such a huge role in uh, the security of Eastern Europe these days. First of all, I'm imagining that your silence is just that you're politely waiting your turn, but there seems to be a lot of heated debate between the other two. Do you want to jump in at this point? Uh, I think uh, the summit, uh, what can Russian Federation uh, do at this stage is to release our political prisoners. We have 114 political prisoners at the moment uh, in uh, Russian prisons. It can also uh, stop uh, deliberate change of population. It's an artificial change of population because they are violating the Geneva Convention. Uh, there is a destruction of a, a natural heritage. They can stop it. So this does not require any other means. It's, uh, maybe the, they could also stop uh, to continue militarizing Crimea. So those are the things that uh, we are ready to discuss and we are going to uh, focus uh, during the Crimean summit. And we would like the world to hear uh, the truth about it and support us in our uh, goal to deoccupy and reintegrate this uh, temporary occupied territory. Okay, so it might be a reasonable idea. Vyacheslav, I'm coming to you, even though you seem to be on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes, I am I'm on the... I tell you what, I'll, I'll go to you, Pavel, on this one. It seems to me that the idea of a meeting between um, Zelensky, President Zelensky and um, President Putin is a long way off, but that's what um, the summit will be pushing for, will it? I think it might be one of the uh, side ideas, basically, because uh, these initiatives in the Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations are going in parallel and going for a very long time. It is all uh, interconnected also with the Minsk peace process, and uh, Crimean platform is just one of the, basically, uh, lines of the thought in the bilateral relations. So, obviously, uh, the, the Zelensky-Putin uh, high-level summit would make a lot of sense because there are so many issues, including uh, uh, mentioned by Mr. Umerov, uh, issues of political prisoners. You know, we have, we have heard about this. You know, there are many more uh, uh, multiple violations of human rights, but also the wider issue of... Uh, OK, well, uh, let's, let's go to Moscow to get Vyacheslav's view. Um, you finished your phone call now. Thank you very much indeed. Um, to get your view on why a summit between Putin and Zelensky um, is unlikely. It is not unlikely. It is impossible on my point of view because uh, the different levels of our responsibility and I think any, any um, discussion on the Crimea, it is not the subject for Putin because Putin is ready to meet anyone, anywhere. How to fulfill But you just said Minsk he wouldn't. Agreement. It was impossible for him to meet Zelensky, so he won't meet anybody anywhere. Well, they, he tried to meet, to, to suggest, or he uh, suggested to meet in Crimea. Please, come to Crimea and meet with Putin there. That's what suggestion of uh, Putin for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for Ukrainian president. But don't you only make that so kind of... Don't, don't you only make that kind of suggestion when you know that the other side is going to... Internal going to refuse to accept it. In Russia. What I hear here, it is hope that in the Russian Federation, some people, opposition, 
<coughs> will make changes and they will agree to to uh, to return to return or to change status of Crimea. Okay, quick I final word, Rustam. I'm sorry, Vladislav. We're going to have to put your microphone Crimea down. We've only got one minute it's left. By the way, how many more years is this going to be on the agenda rather than actually happening on the ground? I think uh, uh, I'm. 100% sure that uh, it will happen. Uh, it takes time. Uh, Russia will change position. The Ukrainian temporary occupied territories will return to Ukraine, and we will be a part of NATO and EU. It takes time, and that's why we are ready to negotiate to start this. Well, because OK, it doesn't seem that that invitation to sit down and talk is going to be accepted by Moscow, unless it happens to be in Crimea. Uh, which Ukraine, of course, says impossible. Ne'er the twain shall meet. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for coming on this programme. Appreciate your time. And wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable, we thank you for your indulgence. And we hope you will be with us next time we take to the airwaves. Until then, for me, David Foster and the Roundtable team. Goodbye. <laughs>